introducing our very special speaker today, but I'd like to remind everybody, uh, I'd like you to save the questions that you have, okay, please, until the end of his presentation, and then we can ask questions. And if you have phones, uh, turn them on vibrate, please. And when this is all over, I have a really cool trick to show you on how to uh, mute your phones for a temporary period of time. It's really cool. But anyway, our speaker today is Dr. Stringer. He is the medical director of the whole pulmonary rehab operation, our pulmonary re rehab operation here. He oversees everybody's charts and how everybody's doing in rehab. And I knew him from the Clinical Trials Center at LA Biomed. He is uh, part of the Pulmonary Education Research Foundation, which I was involved with. I've gone through a number of clinical trials with him. And Dr. Stringer is just a totally, totally cool doctor. I gotta tell you, he knows more about pulmonary rehabilitation than anybody I know. And he's, all, he's a cyclist, he's an avid exerciser, and he knows so much about pulmonary disease. And it's my great honor to introduce our Dr. William Stringer. Thank you very much, Thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, we'll just turn that on. <clears throat> so, uh, I think it's great that you guys get out and, and socialize with each other. You have a lot of great events. I think bringing the IPF people into the, the fold will be great. Um, as you know, I'm, obviously I do clinical care for um, pulmonary patients, uh, rehabilitation, exercise, um, it's one of my passions, um, but also research. And so, um, you know, no matter where we are in, in our human existence, um, there's always some way to make it a little bit better. And I think research is one of the things that does make things better. I'm going to sort of talk about the other side of science today. Um, obviously, medicine is very focused on science, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the humanities and what those are and how that helps um, us be better doctors. Um, I teach uh, both the medical students at UCLA and interns and residents, people who are just out of medical school. Um, so I try to give them a little idea on this side of it as well. So anyway, um, that's... Goy up there, I'm going to use him as kind of an example today of a few things we're going to be talking about. Um, but um, the things that we're going to try to hit today are essentially what are the humanities and what's their value um, in medicine. And um, how can medicine or the humanities sort of approach different problems. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about death and um, what that means um, both for um, the humanities and for medicine. And then um, I'm going to give you some examples. Um, primarily from art and literature, but some um, some music we have time, although the acoustics in this place are probably not going to be too great. Um, but I'll, um, I'll come back to that. So humanity is actually, um, a large part of most universities is actually devoted to humanities. Um, they talk about the social sciences, yeah. think about history, anthropology, um, communications, um, law, um, divinity. Those are all things that um, are deep departments in most universities. Yes, ma'am? Uh, just that can you hold the mic a little bit closer? A little closer. Okay, you say I'm too loud, so um, yeah, sorry about that. So um, just that the humanities are a, are a big portion of many universities um, and have been for a long period of time. Um, science and um, medicine are more of a late arrival. Um, the real the scientific revolution started in the, the Renaissance about 1500. So we're only about 500 years into um, into medicine. But obviously, we're millions of years into being humans, and we just have to figure out um, how to put those together. So the way that humanity studies things is usually through um, study of, of human behavior. That could be language, that could be music, um, that could be art, um, that could be the way that we interact with social media, etc. Um, but they also study ancient languages and look at the way that those languages um, manifest today. And then obviously, literature is um, a very important part of it. So the similarities really are that they both are very careful observers of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, they do talk about the human condition, but they talk about how to make human condition better and also what are the flaws in our, our human condition. Um, they also uh, require a lot of thought thoughtfulness, a lot of um, planning, and a lot of education um, to, um, to do those types of studies. And um, just like medicine, it's really a lifelong devotion. Now, most people that study the humanities um, are deeply interested in um, the results. So anyway, 
Um, there's a lot more technology that's being applied to the humanities, especially history um, at this point. Um, even using things like um, DNA analysis to understand um, various plagues and other things that we've had throughout humanity. Um, but there's certainly some art in medicine and some medicine in art. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of both of those. So this is the definition of medical humanities. Um, so what they're talking about is how does this relate to medicine? Um, they're talking about um, these different fields, like I just talked about, literature, philosophy, religion, etc. Social sciences, which really just sort of talks about our culture and how we, um, how we interact with each other, and then the arts and their application both to medical education and to practice. So that's how the New York University defines it. And there's actually plenty of websites if you're interested in a particular part of the medical humanities, say it's um, medical ethics or um, death and dying or AIDS or um, war and medicine. There's different universities that sort of specialize in these different areas. And um, I'll provide you a list of this later. It's too small for you guys to see. Um, but this is Alexander Pope, who was um, commented on a lot of things in his life. But he talks about the proper study of mankind as man. So. Um, this, uh, I think, is important. I read this uh, a few years ago, and it really struck home. As, uh, we start talking about genes, and we start talking about um, the biological regeneration, stem cells, um, all those kind of things that we're very hopeful will come to pulmonary medicine, uh, but always realizing that that's just one organ in a body that's uh, a person. And so um, the first thing we try to teach our medical students really is to think about the person, not just the individual organ. So obviously we think a lot about heart and lungs and muscles um, during exercise and at rest. And we think a lot about oxygen therapy and dyspnea, shortness of breath. Um, but you still need to be thinking about the whole organism. Okay, so the interesting thing is that we tend to think about science as dealing with facts and humanity is dealing with you know, our values or what we, what we think is a value in our culture. Um, so that's another way to think about it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I, I've talked here before about Beethoven, but this is a quote. Um, this is a, actually the 100 year anniversary of Be Beethoven's death. Um, so that'd be 1927, he died in 1827. Um, but you know that there's very few of us that are gonna be talking about in 100 years. You know, that'll be two or three or four generations in the future. And um, most of what we contribute in life is not going to be of the level of somebody like Beethoven. Um, but they, he talks about um, this summary of what Beethoven's life was about. And he talks about connecting things that you may not think about in terms of religion, but, or in terms of music, but he talks about religion and ethics and philosophy and the arts. And talks about how he came to the highest peaks of each one of those um, using music. Um, so if you're a music fan, um, I, say, I don't think I can play it today, but um, we're, I would definitely recommend a lot of what, um, what Beethoven did. But I talked a little bit about this when I was um, doing the talk on Beethoven. Um, there was a very prominent pianist, actually, in Vienna. Um, and she was very good at playing the, um, the piano and took lessons from him and was one of the superstars. Um, but um, she, she actually lost a child, which I think is got to be one of the most difficult things for human beings to understand is not to have um, uh, a child go on to the next generation. But um, she came over to his house and what he did was he actually just improvised on the piano for almost an hour, didn't say anything, just played music um, for this person. And, um, and basically she said that, you know, he told me everything that I needed to know and comforted me with that music more than words could have um, could have done. So, um, the um, like I say, the playing this today is going to be a little different. But if you um, if you're a classical music fan, um, look into the second movement of um, the Appassionata. What it is is it's a theme and variation. So it starts with a very dark minor chord, uh, very slow. Um, all the kind of characteristics of music that we think about. And over time, it becomes more syncopated. It actually um, goes up to a higher pitch, goes to a major key. I don't know if you realize, but all the birds sing in major keys. That's why we like to hear the sounds of birds. Um, but anyway, and then it actually has this ascending portion um, up to the end. And by the time you're done, it's almost, um, almost like whatever you were upset about, you're sort of able to not only deal with it, but feel good about it. Um, so anyway, so uh, you've all probably heard of the Hippocratic Oath. This is something in some form that most medical students take when they, they leave medical school. 
and it, it has a lot of different tenets. Uh, one of the most important is really to do no harm, um, to take your patient's welfare um, at the highest um, uh, consideration and make sure that what you're doing doesn't harm that person. Um, and of course, that's not always possible in medicine. There's certainly things that we do that have risk, um, but we try to minimize that risk. But anyway, um, this is actually from a, um, the, the monks in the 13th and 14th century used to recopy everything because there was no, no Xerox machines, no printing press yet, right? The Gutenberg printing press hadn't shown up. So they copied things. Um, and they copied this Hippocratic Oath in the shape of a cross. Um, so I thought that was actually kind of nice. Um, it's in the, um, the Vatican in Rome if you travel there. So, so one of the tenets here um, is to think about uh, medicine as not only a science, but um, as an art, and that um, sometimes really aggressive therapy that we propose may not be what the patient actually wants. Um, so we're going to talk a little more about that, uh, realizing uh, when you're in medical school you're learning about all the new high-tech ways to fix things, um, but I think as you get further into medicine you realize there's some things we can fix and some things we have to live with and some things we can't fix. We're obviously human beings as well, um, being physicians. Okay. Um, so this, this really talks, this is another part of one of these Hippocratic Oaths, um, but um, basically talking about, um, thinking about how that illness affects not only the individual, but the family. So, you know, when you read medical textbooks about pneumonia or COPD or heart failure, um, you're learning about the pathophysiology of that disease, um, but you're not learning much about the person who has that disease. And so that's another thing that we try to encourage in the medical students is to think about how that disease impacts that person, um, and also how that person deals with it. Um, and obviously depression and other things can be a component of um, severe disease. And you've all um, had to um, deal with that at some level. Um, so we try to teach our physicians, and obviously you guys have become connoisseurs of physicians as well. Um, being ill or chronically ill, um, you actually do get to visit physicians a lot. So um, I think that you also um, can help them become better physicians too um, by sharing a little bit of your experiences. So, so what's a good physician? Um, obviously you want somebody who's competent and knows what they're doing, but this is kind of the, the next level, you know, um, sort of going from a C to a B to an A. Um, these are the kind of things I think that get you in the A category. And um, the recruitment for medical school now is actually focusing more on humanities-based undergraduate education. So things like music, um, things like writing, English, um, history, um, sociology. Um, so if you want somebody that's in medical school um, that's empathetic, that can understand what that person's dealing with that disease, um, you need somebody that has some degree of empathy. And um, I can teach almost anybody biochemistry. I can't teach you how to be empathetic. Um, so we have some physicians that are not as empathetic as others, and they tend to choose different disciplines in medicine depending on how much empathy it takes, depending on how much interaction with patients it takes. Um, so anyway, but obviously they have to be intelligent. They have to have a sense of duty, and most physicians are good about that. And then um, caring for the less fortunate. Um, I work in a hospital where um, that's what we do all the time. And it, it, at the end of the day, when I drive home, I'm happy about that, um, separate from you know, hopefully getting people to feel better. But anyway, you may not have thought about sort of the derivation of the, the word pathos. Um, but um, you know, talking about pathos actually has lots of different meanings. But it really means um, a suffering or the feeling of suffering or that sort of uncomfortableness that comes with um, illness. And so uh, it's a quality of life, life experience. So you know, we've started to think more about how to evaluate patients' quality of life, um, what they value, what we call patient-reported outcomes. So I might care about your CBC, your hemoglobin's gone up by one, one point. You could probably say, I could care less. What I want to know is, can I walk and do the things I want to do? So, so physicians have to not only care about the hemoglobin, but care about the effects of that hemoglobin on your, your life. Um, so anyway, and also to be sympathetic about it and to realize that, that people go through um, lots of different things. Um, so pathos ends up in a lot of different words. Um, in sympathy, which is pretty easy, empathy, um, which is sort of being able to project yourself. And we have sort of an epidemic of uh, people which we call are on the spectrum now. Um, meaning some degree of um, autism, meaning they, they really don't 
understand body language and um, language and um, subtleties of language um, that they're involved with with other people. So um, empathy is very important. Empathy we've all seen. We've all gotten to the point where we're so tired or we're so despondent that we, we don't care what happens anymore. Um, sociopaths, we've got plenty of those in um, today's society. Um, pathogens, so at the hospital, if your culture comes back positive with a certain bacteria or virus or fungal thing, we call that a pathogen. And then idiopathic um, means that we don't know what happened or we're too dumb as physicians to know what happened. Um, we call that um, idiopathic. Anyway, um, so it's all relative to. Um, uh, some of you don't know, but I was actually treated for leukemia up at City of Hope. And um, I had my chemotherapy, and I barfed my guts out, and it was the worst experience of my life. But as I walked around there, there were people that had had transplantations, that had graft versus host, that had fungal infections. So I kind of looked like a well baby check up there compared to everybody else. Um, so you, you realize that even though you've got a lot of stuff going on, there's a lot of other people that are having to deal with much more. And so I think that's an important thing for you guys when you socialize to think about, you know, yes, I've got stuff going on, but there's things I can add to other people's lives. Um, the interesting thing, I talked to a lot of people up there when I was in the hospital. None of them ever asked me once what I do. Um, it's kind of interesting. Oh, you're a doctor, huh? No, but they, they didn't ask, so I didn't tell them. Anyway, but I had a pretty good idea what they were trying to go through anyway. So, um, who knows who Sasha Barrett Cohen is? Yes, very good. Okay, well, this is his uncle. Um, he wrote a book um, talking about the degrees of empathy. Um, so most medical schools now test their um, applicants for empathy. Uh, you might think that's a good or a bad thing, um, but it does help to understand whether that person is going to be a good physician or not. If they don't have a large degree of empathy, they're probably not going to be a good physician. Um, so that's important to remember. Um, and he's quantified this, made a scale, everything else. And he's, he's not as reverent as uh, Sasha. Or Borat, if you're uh, so. Um, so UC Irvine. Anybody go to UC Irvine? No UC Irvine people. Anyway, they have a huge medical humanities um, department down there. Um, all sorts of good stuff comes out of them. Um, but this is, you know, sort of what you'd think is the standard eye chart, right? And you, which level can you read down to? But it's actually Plexus is their journal, and. This was an article where um, she was a PhD, but she was a doctor. She went in to, the, um, to see the ophthalmologist, and she had some dread disease that they were going to start some injections into her eye. And um, one of the side effects, it was going to change the color of her eyes from brown to blue, apparently. And so she was trying to um, explain that this, this, this would sort of change who she is. And um, the ophthalmologist, and if you visit an ophthalmologist, they're busy, they're not um, very wordy people, um, and they're sort of all business. Um, the person didn't want to hear it. Um, and that, that made her change physicians because that person wouldn't sit and listen to what she, she was concerned about. He was thinking all about the disease and what am I going to do, and that person was thinking, you know, I need some help understanding this. So anyway, um, it, the little thing's called raccoon eyes, it's very cute. Anyway, um, so there's a whole bunch of things that medicine tries to answer, um, but there's all sorts of approaches in, in the humanities as well. So, for instance, you know, what is life, or you know, how do you stay he healthy? What what is death? You know, what happens after death? Um, those kind of things. And is there a way to prevent death? Um, are we all doomed to die, or, or could we actually be um, somewhat eternal? Um, so, obviously. Humanities have thought about that a lot. Religion's thought about that a lot. Um, but um, medicine thinks about it a lot too, especially working on stem cells. Um, so if we can unlock stem cells, we could get organs to regenerate themselves. Now, it sounds like science fiction, but um, it's not ready for pulmonary yet. A lot of people ask me that. Um, but it will be. Um, the question is when. So um, I keep hoping. There's a, a bunch of clinical trials that are underway now. Um, and most of them are being done outside the United States. Um, so the quality control of those studies are, are not very good. Okay, so anybody ever seen this picture before? Okay, so, so you got this wonderful little nuclear family. Obviously this is dad, mom, two kids, and an older gentleman, right? Okay, so now look at the ships in the harbor, okay? One large ship, two small ships, right? Mom, 
two kids, right? One ship coming towards us, you know, ascending in life, one ship moving away. So it's, it's all about essentially the cycle of life, right? Um, you all have kids and grandkids. You've had people pass on around you. You've had family pass around. Um, so you might say, oh, this is kind of a nice little beach scene, um, or rocky beach scene maybe. Um, but it's really trying to imply something else. So that's what I like when I go to, um, I go to museums. I, I, I always put down um, the, you know, the places you can see these things at. Um, and, and anybody traveled to Madrid? Okay, Prado in Madrid? Okay, wonderful. Okay, so that's actually my favorite museum in the world. And because it houses about as much Goya as you can possibly stand. Um, so Goya actually lived a long time. Um, he lived into his 80s, which was very uncommon back in the, the 1700s, 1800s. Um, he was the court, court painter. and. At work, he was painting these um, beautiful sort of parasols and bright colors. And then I'll show you what he was doing at home, OK? So um, this is, well, I'm going to skip that. So this is an example of what he was doing at work. So there's, there's beautiful soft light coming through this parasol, different colors, beautiful um, fabric, um, young people, beautiful, you know, royalty. Um, so that's what he painted at work. Now. Um, this is what he painted at home, okay? Um, so these are our two brothers bludgeoning each other. Um, they're stuck in quitsand, so they can't get away from each other, and they're bludgeoning each other. So taking any country that's had a civil war, that's empathetic of that. Um, this happened to be the Spanish Civil War. Um, this is uh, the Cabra. Um, this is the Witch's Sabbath. Um, so. Uh, a very dark individual here, probably you know representing the devil, and um, sort of a, a lady with a baby here, which could be the Madonna, but obviously um, sort of grotesque looking faces and everything else. And um, this is Saturn actually eating his son. Um, so, so obviously this guy had lots of different things he could paint, but he also he was expressing different moods, right? When he was at work and painting for the king, he had to show that, I mean, I, I doubt the king would have liked any of this. Um, but um, does anybody know what sordo means in Spanish? I heard it someplace, deafness. Yeah, very good. Okay, um, so actually Goya was deaf, and there's a lot of thought about, um, you have a certain number of senses, but let's say one of your senses goes away, your vision or your hearing, your brain starts to use other parts of, of the brain that would be using for hearing or seeing for something else. So he, he was actually as deaf his whole life. So the question is whether he was using it for something else. So the Quinta de Sordo um, is the house of deafness. Um, this is actually what the three dimensions would have looked like. And the three dimensions showed these very long paintings on different uh, levels. It was a two-story house. So that's all of what he had. Uh, this is one of the Mahas. Um, probably one of his old girlfriends, and um, other sort of sinister stuff. So if you go to Madrid in the Prado, they have um, every one of these up. Um, so usually I get stuck in that room and I don't go anywhere else. Um, but he also was sort of the, the first political cartoonist. Um, he, um, he sort of lampooned all the royalty, all the nonsense that goes on in um, the rich and the poor. Um, and he put out what he called the capriccios. So, so just looking at this, there's no question that this guy is older. He's actually got a um, what we call um, kyphosis, or leaning forward. He's supporting himself. He's slowly moving. Um, but you know, he can no longer um, um, do all the things he wants to do at age 98. But the ability to sketch that out, um, and he sketched war, he sketched poverty, he sketched um, mental illness. Um, prisoners, all sorts of things that you wouldn't have guessed that somebody that was the court painter was doing this. So if there's ever a, an example of his capriccios at some place close to you, um, definitely go, and there's quite a few of them in, in Madrid as well. Okay, so here's my favorite one. Anybody seen this before? Okay, so he had a variety of ailments throughout his whole life. He was treated by a whole bunch of doctors, specifically for the hearing. He kept thinking, if I just see the right doctor, they'll fix my hearing, right? So here's the dead patient, here's the doctor, right? 
He's trying to say, you know, uh, what did the patient die of? He's still trying to feel a pulse here, right? So basically, he's just lampooning um, the medical system, um, basically saying that, you know, we're another word for mules um, <laughs> or burrows. Um, I won't repeat. But anyway, I, I, I can take a joke like anybody else because we've all been to the bedside of somebody who couldn't fix. Um, but I think that he was trying to say that these people take my money, they don't help me, they just frustrate me, um, etc. So, you know, that we've all had that feeling too. We, you know, you went in to get your car fixed, drive it home, it's doing the same darn thing, except it just happens to be healthcare, right? Um, okay, so hopefully you have seen this one. Um, this is sort of the quintessential family doctor um, and country doctor. And there's actually various interpretations of there, but there's a small child, um, there's a small either toy or handkerchief on the floor. This is the physician, this is dad, this is mom. So there's just early morning light coming into this, um, into this picture. And so uh, one interpretation is that the, the child has finally fallen asleep. Mother has been up all night trying to take care of the baby. And, um, and you know, that the patient's going to recover. The second one is that the, the child has died. Um, and the mother realizes that. Um, so that's the more popular interpretation. I like the first one better. Um, but anyway, um, this also kind of illustrates, you know, where medicine was before about 1900. You know, I mean, we came, we, we, we empathized with people, we said how sorry we were, we tried our best, but most, most patients died. Um, and, and sometimes because of the things we were doing. So science, um, since 1900, in the last 100 years, we've made tremendous advances, but there's still plenty of ways to go. Um, okay, so, so this is Goya as well. Um, you can see that these ladies um, are well-dressed, but all, all the characteristics we'd associate with being older, um, sort of loss of body mass index, um, lean body tissue, changing of the face, almost a skull-like facies. And then there's somebody behind here that's sort of looking down on this. Um, you know, you could say that's an angel taking you someplace, could be the devil, who, who knows. Okay, so um, this is a great painting too. Um, this is actually um, Bernatch the Elder. And so, you know that um, Ponce de Leon came to Florida looking for the Fountain of Youth. He found Florida, but he didn't find the Fountain of Youth. Um, but, um, this is somewhat chauvinistic, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Anybody ever seen this before? Okay, so you come over here, you know, brought in by a wagon or your wheelchair or whatever. Um, you jump in the water. As the water, you know, goes, um, bathes you, um, you get younger and younger, and you bounce out over here. Um, you're ready for things. There's a lady jumping into a tent. There's a banquet over here. There's all sorts of frivolity. But all these are women, okay? No men. So why don't we need men to go through the fountain of youth? Well, um, our, our current president would probably demonstrate this. So the way to generate, regenerate an old man is a young lady to get married to. So that's the chauvinistic part of this, okay? So, so men just need young ladies. Women need to be regenerated. So anyway. Um, but the idea of a fountain of youth is essentially what science is after. We're, we're after trying to figure out um, why we die. Um, there's a lot of portrayals of death um, in the literature. Um, this is one that I kind of like. Um, there are all kinds of different statues here. Um, sort of death standing behind this person. Um, and they're going about their usual day, their arts, um, whatever. Um, this is um, a particularly good one, I think. Um, this was done um, after the Black Death. Uh, the Black Death was plague in, um, in Europe. Um, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the people in Europe died um, with the plague. So you can imagine this thing swooping down in a city. Um, there's this person who's obviously expired, somebody um, having a tearful minute, and um, the plague going on and affecting other people. So this is how art would approach this. Obviously, we'd approach it as Bacillus pestis, and you know, there's mnemonic and bubonic forms, etc. But this is how art would do it. Now, the other thing is when you go to a museum and you start to see certain things, um, they're talking about the limitations of life. Okay, 
They're talking about things that are ephemeral that go away. So, for instance, bubbles, you know, the bubbles are going to burst, right? Um, skull, obviously, that's pretty easy. But music is also considered a sign of being um, mortal. Um, each music starts, each music has a tempo, and each music stops, right? Um, so that's a piece of music. Um, flowers frequently are done like that, um, dried, um, like furs and animals, those kind of things. So that's all sort of implying um, that life is, you know, a short amount of time and death is on the way. So, so that's kind of art. Um, this is literature. Um, so this is my favorite thing. Um, if you've never read anything by Khalil Gibran, you should, um, because the guy was really um, very thoughtful. Have you read something? Yeah? Yeah, The Prophet. Very good. Um, okay. So, you know, for, for, for what is it to die but to stand naked in the wind and melt into the sun? And what is it to cease breathing but to, to free the breath from its restless tides that it may rise and expand and seek God and then comfort? I mean, how, how could you possibly write a medical text or a research paper that sounded anything like that? Um, and only when you drink from the river of silence shall you indeed sing. And when you have reached the mountaintop, and you should begin to climb. And when the earth shall claim your limbs, then you shall truly dance. I mean, that's, I mean, that's as gripping as any discussion about death. Um, and obviously, that's, that's failure for us as physicians. Um, but uh, we try to uh, make the, you know, the little dash on people's gravestone. Um, that's the part that we can affect. Um, hopefully expand, but also make better. OK, so anybody ever seen this before? Okay, so this is Goya. He's deathly ill. This is his physician, Dr. Ariada. And the, the lights aren't very good in here, but there's all sorts of demons right behind here. They're in a ring, okay? So the doctor is protecting him from that. Um, the doctor is obviously caring for him. The doc he is trying to hang on for dear life, right? He's got a hold of that um, sheet, and he's not going to let go. And there's some kind of mixture, libation, you know, uh, complementary alternative medicine because there really there was no antibiotics there was nothing really you could do for him but be empathetic um, but this is what Goya painted after he got better um, this is the only physician he saw in a favorable light I just showed you the other Capriccio with the um, uh, the mule um, so um, he almost died at age 73 and this is the inscription here which if you read Spanish is here but Goya in gratitude to his friend Ariada that was the doctor for his compassion and care, which he saved my life during the acute and dangerous illness um, he suffered towards the end of the year, 1819, um, his 73rd year. I painted it in 1820. And so if you go to Minneapolis for anything, you have to go see that painting. It's really wonderful. Okay, anyway. So, when you talk about Jesus. art, you think about music or, music or medicine or humanities, you know, they begin to blend here. So if you, if you think about somebody like da Vinci, he really was a scientist. He was a keen observer of things. He drew, um, you know, just most amazing. Yeah. He still show up in, in anatomy texts. Uh, they're so wonderful. Um, there is some interesting things, though. Um, uh, probably nobody's here as an OBGYN person, but the uterus isn't perfectly circular. But you know, a circle is a perfect shape, right? So this is, you know, this is life. This is this, the creation of life. Um, and so he didn't draw it like a uterus should look. He, he drew it as if he saw that as sort of the, the infinite cycle of life. Um, and then he did great things with bones, um, muscles. Um, he was actually quite a grave robber because it was actually forbidden by the Catholic Church to, di to dissect bodies. But obviously the only way to teach people about, you know, about anatomy is to use a human body. We do use some electronic things now, but there's an enormous number of people that actually donate their, their bodies um, to medical schools, and um, you know, medical students are eternally grateful to them. I mean, it's, it's one of the contributions that you really can make to the, to the future generations. Um, anyway, um, this is Vesalius. Um, he was actually um, Belgium, but, um, and he was the physician to the, the king. Um, but he put all these different skeletons in different poses here. Um, and a lot of them were people that had recently been executed, so he has a few that are sort of hanging and those kind of things. But 
um, was interested in muscles as well as um, the, the bones. Anyway, so you've probably heard about Dante's Seven Sins. Um, most of this will get you the doctor sooner or later. Um, <laughs> so, um, since, since we just had lunch here, I'll, I'll start with this. So, Gilray actually was an English painter. So this is, this is a gentleman, he's just had this very big meal, sort of sitting back in the chair, a little groggy, not really interacting with anybody, just about half asleep, right? Which is you guys listening to me talk. Um, and then, this is the person that had just the, the light meal, you know? They're interacting with people, they're you know, articulate, they've had a small meal, they're, they're not sleepy at all. Um, so he talks about temperance um, and a frugal meal. So, um, so there's some, some things in art that help us hopefully be better, um, better people. So, um, so you guys have probably never seen a case of smallpox. I, I never have. Um, but the original, um, the original vaccination for smallpox was either to take scabs off somebody who had smallpox, grind them up, and put them in the nose of your kids to give them smallpox because you're less likely to die of it when you're young. And the other one was that um, they noticed that the, the, the milkmaids that milked the cows never got smallpox. They had beautiful skin. So, so why? There's a, a virus that's very close to smallpox that's um, in the udder of a, um, a cow. It's called cowpox. Um, so, so what happened was that um, they, the cowpox part of it this is, this is supposed to be a vaccination scene, but every place they're putting the vaccination, a little cow is growing here. Okay. So this was his sort of attempt at humor. Um, but you know, smallpox was no, um, no joke, and a lot of people died. In fact, we probably decimated most of the Native Americans here in the United States with, with smallpox and other infectious illnesses. So um, vaccination was done. So, so since I did research, I have to tell you one other little thing. So the person that actually figured out that the cowpox uh, vaccination actually worked um, took um, 17 kids, vaccinated them with the cowpox, then, then exposed them to, co uh, to smallpox. And a, a large number of them would have been sick, and one or two of them would have died, um, and none of them died. But of course, you couldn't even do that study today. Um, you couldn't do it on kids. You couldn't do it without their permission. You'd have to get parental consent. And all sorts of in, um, what we call IRBs or institutional review boards would have said, what, are you crazy? Um, but of course, it did work. And uh, we hear more about the things that work than don't work. Anyway, so I like that one about vaccination. OK, so here's my favorite. Anybody have gout? OK. So, so um, Queen Elizabeth actually had gout, so did Henry VIII, um, and it was because they had very good food compared to everybody else. But the inflammation is frequently on a big toe, starts at night, um, and so this is the devil after that toe. Um, so I don't think you could have a description of that in, in prose that would actually be as good as that. Yeah, if, you, if you ever had a gouty attack, um, you'll know about it. Okay, so the last thing, we did auction off some alcohol. Um, so, so. There was a big crisis in England because a whole bunch of people were drinking gin, okay? So this is a lady, she's drunk, she's not even holding on to her kid, her kid is laying off. There's no commerce going on, people are sort of lethargic. This guy is, is so interested in gin, he's not even eating anymore, okay? All right, so, so the fix for that, according to Hogarth, is Beer Street, okay? So Beer is okay, you know, there's commerce going on, people are doing all what they're supposed to be doing, you know, paintings going on, etc. So this was the idea that gin was bad, beer was good. Um, so anyway, um, so lots of people have tried to portray the vices. Um, this is the Edward Munch, I'll show you the more famous one in a minute. Um, but he was actually the son of a physician. Um, his mother actually died of tuberculosis, so he really had kind of an unhappy life. Um, and some people think that the genesis of the scream, I'm going to tell you about in a minute, was the death of his sister. Um, but he tried to kill himself, and it didn't work. And there was an hour and a half where he had a surgical debridement. So this is him painting his surgical debridement, and all these people looking at him and saying, you know, what's wrong with this guy? You know, the, the shame of going through that. Um, 
This is uh, sort of the sick child part of it. There's lots of paintings like this where the mother and the, the child are sitting and um, trying to get over some illness. And that's the scream, um, which I, undoubtedly you guys have heard. There's lots of thoughts about what the scream is about. I prefer tuberculosis, but who knows. Um, okay, so Van Gogh. This is also another doctor. This is Dr. Gachet. Anybody know why there's different colors here? Anybody been to the Van Gogh Museum? Amsterdam? Okay, you get to Amsterdam, you have to go to the Van Gogh Museum for two reasons. One is, I think I showed you the picture of the skull that's smoking. Um, that's Van Gogh. It's beautiful. Um, but the thinking was that Van Gogh was actually taking digitalis, and digitalis changes your yellow blue um, receptors so that he had a lot of yellow and blue and things. So um, this was presumably pre and post um, digitalis. Now if that's true or not, who knows. But this is the more common one that you see. Um, this is the wheat fields with crows. So there's the blues and the yellows. So some people think that's why that he was painting. Of course he was wildly mad, so who knows. Um, anyway, so you know, why I care about all this stuff? Well, um, I think it does make you think more creatively. I, there's almost nothing that I, I, I don't see in an art museum or someplace else, music, um, reading, that makes me think about, you know, how could I actually be a, a better uh, physician? And to think more empathetically. And the humanities actually do care about life's important questions. Now, there's not a lot of answers to those important questions, but we're working on those. Um, and then, you know, to understand their world and understand the perception of the patient and what they value is important, um, I think is the, is the most important um, use of the humanities. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is that, yeah, you, know, you may think about doctors as sort of being all, um, you know, all intact and um, never getting depressed and never getting tired and um, never getting snappy. I mean, we, we have all those human weaknesses. So uh, realizing your, your physician is, is working usually fairly hard. Using, losing a lot of sleep, sometimes ignoring his family or having family issues or whatever. And we have, unfortunately, a lot of drugs and alcohol and um, physicians as well. So physician wellness is like a big thing now. Not only is what we call physician burnout, but um, just trying to make the quality of life higher in our, um, our tra trainees, graduates, and also trying to make sure that their career is, is long and fruitful because it takes a long time to create a physician and you really don't want them sort of supernovaing in a, in a few years after they graduate. So, so it's actually sort of a wellness thing now too. Anyway, um, so anyway, these are some um, references. As I mentioned, UC Irvine is actually really good. National Medicine is good. Anybody read Hectorian International? <coughs> they have a whole medical humanities area, which is just wonderful. And then these are a couple things. If, um, if, you, if anybody psychiatry or psychology background, so um, <laughs> this Wolfenstein um, actually wrote this in 66. It's called Goya's <coughs> It's about that three-dimensional structure I just talked about and what was going on in Goya's brain when he was painting this stuff at work and what was going on at home. And obviously, he was massively depressed at home. Um, he was probably bipolar as well. Um, so those can both uh, result in that. But anyway, I'll stop there. Happy to take any questions, and thank you for inviting me. All right. Yes, sir. Have there been any real studies that show that if someone takes humanities in college, rather than taking science courses, that they're really going to be more empathetic? Well, okay, so that's that's a complicated question because who goes and takes those courses as an undergraduate? Somebody who values those, right? But what medical schools have tilted in the last few years is now are they are looking for the person who can do biochemistry or are they looking for somebody that has humanities background because that's the person that will have better empathy. And they test for him for empathy. But the question you're asking is, does that result in somebody who's a better physician? Um, there's lots of discussion about that. I doubt that there's anything that's, that you would consider rigorous science. It's more sociology type of research. I would, you know, there's probably a feeling that people who take science courses are, are a type that are less empathetic. 
sympathetic than people who take humanities. However, when students realize that the medical schools are looking for humanities students, those that would normally take science are now going to take humanities. And as far as I'm concerned, whether you're going to have empathy or not is formed before you enter college. And taking a philosophy course or a sociology course or history is not going to make you an empathetic individual. Well, I, I actually think that you can change the degree of empathy, but whether you can start from very low and get to very high, I, I actually agree with what you're saying. But, but I also like to think that, that human beings have the ability to change. And so I think being in medical school, seeing people who are ill, realizing that you know, your, your life is pretty blessed compared to a lot of people you have to take care of, that, that it may bring out, you know, if that empathy has been underdeveloped, I think it has to be there, but maybe it will help to develop it to a point. And then the last thing is, when you get into medical school, um, let's say you pick to be a radiologist. So what do you do in a, as a radiologist? You sit in a dark room and look at images. You never, you, anybody ever actually talk to a radiologist? Um, okay. I have to hear what that discussion was about. Um, but, um, but that's the kind of pathologist. So what do pathologists deal with all day? Dead people, right? So you don't have to worry a lot about you know, being a great conversationalist. So, so I, think that, I think you're right. And I think that they choose those when they go into college because of their pre-existing um, you know, uh, proclivities. But there may be a way to develop it. And when you get into medical school, you tend to pick the things that go with your personality. So more empathetic people probably end up in things like primary care, pediatrics, um, end of life, palliative care, um, things like that, where uh, understanding what that person wants is, is as important or maybe more important than the latest therapy for something. But anyway, it's a great question, which there probably isn't a great answer. <laughs> anyway, other thoughts? Yes, ma'am. I was wondering how, how medical school has changed from the time you were in to now. Have you seen changes? Yeah, so when I was there, the dinosaurs were still walking around. <laughs> <laughs> so um, but it's a great question, actually, because um, my son's in medical school right now. Um, he's at Columbia in New York. Um, so, um, and I'm very familiar with uh, UCLA and their paradigm for teaching. Um, they, 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 like every university, have started to add a lot of courses that are focused on um, sort of wellness and empathy and um, you know, even things like ethics and morals, um, things that we probably didn't get very much of when I was in medical school. Um, you know, when, when, if you did medical school even 50 years ago, you spent almost two years just doing anatomy because there wasn't much else. But now you have genes, you have organelles, you have regenerative science, you have proteomics, genome, genomics, metabolomics, um, transcriptomics. Um, so there's a lot more stuff to learn. Um, so I think that the, the burden of knowledge is much bigger now, learning in school. Um, but I think they have, they have started to focus less on um, some of the things that you can go look up or you know, quickly understand. And the other part is that they've started to focus more on that interaction with the patient. Um, I think that's most curriculums throughout the United States have moved in that direction. So the so last thing I'm going to tell you, though, um, the, the 1919 um, Harvard Medical School graduating class. So 1919 was right on the cusp of things like antibiotics and transfusions and everything you would think about for a normal hospital. So the dean gets up there and he says, you know, we're very proud of all you people. You know, you graduated, you're the best of the best, and um, you know, we're just so proud of you. Um, there's only one problem. He said, well, there's actually two problems. One problem is about half of what we taught you is probably wrong, which is true, right? And then the other thing he said was, the other thing is we don't know which half it is. <laughs> so, so anyway, what a great thing to say at a graduation ceremony. Um, but I think it's true, you know, I, I think that the great thing about science is we're able to say we don't know. Um, just like that question we just asked back there. We don't know the answer to some of these things. And so if we don't do research, we never figure it out. But there's always going to be unknowns. And um, I, some of the mystery of life is some of those unknowns. I mean, that you know, you're just not pre-programmed to do everything you, you're going to do in your life. You, know, you can change things. You can do things differently. 
Um, so I, I hope that um, some of that mystery never completely goes away, but um, there's some, plenty of things that I'd like to understand better. But the, um, the curriculum is definitely moving towards um, more focus on the things I just told you rather than just the biochemistry class or the anatomy class, those kind of things. That's a good question. So one more, yes? Um, are doctors required to renew the, like, the license, or I don't know what you have, other than the doctor behind the name? Um, yeah, so, um, how do so, they keep up with all these new things, and do they have to if they're in a specialized area? OK, well, let me give you one number. There's, there's 5,600 pages of medical literature published every day. So I don't know how fast you read, but you know by the end of the week uh, that's you know forty thousand pages worth of stuff. So so the answer is that we turn to things that summarize stuff. So so you have an expert in pulmonary or cardiology, or whatever. You stay up in your area, but the other stuff um, you know you tend to leave behind. That's why you specialize. And I don't know if you guys have gone to an ophthalmologist lately, but there's anterior retina, posterior retina, um, anterior chamber. There's external, you know, there's like all these different things, like you're not an eye doctor? No, I only do this. Um, but there's a reason, because it actually is hard to stay up. The doctors are all required to take continuing medical education, CME. Um, we have 100 hours we're supposed to do every two years, which is quite a bit. But unfortunately, it's probably not enough, um, because there, so many things are changing. Um, but again, you know, a bunch of stuff they told me in medical school is now wrong. So it's actually not so bad that I don't remember that anymore because it was wrong. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, a lot of things that we didn't understand, once you actually understand what the mechanism is behind it, it makes a lot more sense. And, and previous to that, it was just disparate facts. Um, so I think that as we understand the body and how it works and some of the systems that work, say, for the immunologic system or the cardiovascular system, that those things, those principles actually roll into other organs and work well there. And then the other thing we're starting to understand is the way that different tissue in your body communicates with each other, um, which is just like it's an amazing um, network of you know, being the muscles telling the, the absorptive tract, like if you go out and exercise, you're gonna to want to eat, right? So how does how does the muscles tell the gut that they need to absorb things? Or um, when you exercise, you sleep better. How does the muscles tell the brain to sleep better? Um, you know, and depression, mood, all those kind of things are all affected by exercise. So so I think we're learning about how those all work together. Um, but you know that my my goal is any, anybody actually seen the um, um, sort of like in a sci science fiction movie where somebody wants to know something and they just upload it into their brain. Um, so um, I'm kind of hoping for that. Um, so the other one actually, I, I'm going to tell you this one. Um, so I, I saw a, a, a card and it was about getting older. Um, but what they said is they had, they had an Easter egg hunt and they were all Alzheimer's patients. And, and it said, well, step one, we're going to have you hide your own eggs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, at least you have to have some humor in life, too. Um, you know, I, I, it's one of the things I fear the most is, you know, my brain and how it works. So, anyway, yes, sir? Just a comment. You alluded to the Will Body Program. Yep. Both USC and UCLA have those programs. Yes, sir. However, USC will not take you if you're north of 200 pounds. If you're what? UCLA will. Is that right? Um, I didn't realize there was a weight restriction. Um, I tell you, anybody who does that, my hat's off. I'm not sure I could do it myself, and I have benefited from being in the autopsy room with a patient. Um, so um, it's it's a big commitment, but I think that you know, in order for us to make good doctors in the future, they need to understand how the body works, and, and structure equals function. So you have to understand structure to understand structure to understand how the the body actually functions. So it's a great thing. Um, so it sounds like you've looked into this a little bit. Did you decide to do it or no? Only years ago. Yeah, well, very good. I, you, boy, I, I am in awe of you, sir. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, other things? Otherwise, I'll turn it back to Kurt. So the danger is Kurt's going to start talking again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give Dr. Stringer a round of applause. Are we lucky to have this guy as our medical director? Huh? This is really an enlightened physician, and we are so lucky. 
Dr. Stringer, to have you on our team. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. You're very, very welcome. Thanks for